Ladies and gentlemen, Carlos Pujo. Good morning. We are fortunate today to have many civic partners who are passionate in their commitment to better public uh, spaces, chiefly among them Commissioner Sadiq Khan. Thank you, Commissioner. I'm very pleased to be here today to continue a discussion on what, ha what has long been a core issue for the Municipal Arts Society. The MAS believes that public spaces have a profound impact on our sense of belonging and attachment to our city and are incredibly important to the overall health of all New Yorkers and to the livability of New York. One of the MAS's founding missions was to protect and reinforce the beauty of our city's public places and spaces, its civic assets, including parks and public buildings. These efforts continue today in areas like East Midtown, where the MAS is working to ensure the future vitality of this iconic neighborhood by advocating for thoughtful investments in the public realm. And in MAS's work with Gerald Caden through advocates for, public, for privately owned public spaces, oh, we know them as POPs, to reinvigorate our city's collection of POPs. APOPs has developed a fantastic website that launched at the summit last year. I encourage you to visit, um, it's apops.mas.org to find a POPs, review a POPs, or stay up to date on the latest POPs news. As New York City evolves, new models of public space are taking form in our city. How have the latest generation of public spaces affected our identity? What clues do they offer about the role of these spaces in cities? We are fortunate that some very smart urbanists are also thinking about these questions. And here to speak more on this topic are two of the finest. We have Richard Sennett, professor of sociology at New York University and at the London School of Economics and Political Science, and Gerald Caden, professor of urban planning and design at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. Thank you. Thanks. So hi, Richard. It's uh, great to see you up here. It's great to see you in different uh, parts of the world. And uh, since I lost the coin toss, I, I'm the one who speaks. Briefly first, we're going to have a dialogue uh, and talk to each other. Uh, and uh, so let's jump right into it, I think. Uh, politics of public space, and I think it's fair to say uh, Public space is the, the crucial piece of the, the public city. Uh, Richard, you talk about, of course, the, the open city. We're focusing on physical public space. We just heard from someone who has championed one type of physical public space and viewing it in hybrid terms, streets, sidewalks, turning them into plazas. But we also talk about parks, privately owned public spaces, pops, pop-up spaces. The, the city is made up of these places, and they're means to an end. Uh, they're, they're not just there for show. I mean, they're there to, to accommodate and promote democracy, or to encourage a sort of egalitarian sense of the city, or for passive and active recreation, um, or for being seen or seeing other people. And increasingly, we're asking public space, I think, to perform even more uh, environmental uh, conditions of uh, water squares and stormwater management. I mean, we put so much on public space, and yet it's because it's, it's really what cities are all about, finally. Right. So I don't know, as I thought about this in terms of the politics of public space, there were several questions that jumped to my mind and then we talk. Uh, what role does or can public space play in facilitating public participation and engagement uh, in the political process? And we've seen examples of that from Tahrir Square to, uh, to Gezi Park and Taksim Square and Istanbul, Zuccotti Park, of course, right here in New York. Uh, can public space be consequential in defining, realizing, and changing social values? in a way that, that betters our society and our political functioning. Uh, could we, through a plaza, solve problems in Washington? 
uh, and does you public. Always were an optimist. <laughs> well, that's I'm the eternal optimist about cities, as are you, Richard right. said it. Uh, and finally, does public space promote engagement with others and uh, and appreciation of diversity uh, in a way that does advance our, our aspirations for uh, egalitarianism, for for equality. Right. So. Well, I would say about the third of those uh, issues about the political side of public space, something that's very particular to New York City. We are at a moment in which, you know, a public space is both a physical space and it's a social, sp social and political space in this, uh, in this interaction between people. And I think we're at a moment in New York City where we're going to have, uh, if Bill de Blasio becomes our mayor, an enormous change in what we think about public space uh, in terms of what it should do on that third dimension. You can argue that we've re regained a lot of physical public space in the last uh, a decade or so, but we've lost a lot of public space in that other sense. A space where people who are different economically, uh, ethnically, um, in terms of lifestyle, meet for a purpose other than shopping. And uh, I, think, I think New Yorkers recognize this. I think that's why, um, uh, I mean, this two cities idea, you can go too far with it, but in, I suppose in a way, but it represents something very real, which is that we are losing a public realm in New York. Uh, in which people who are different interact. So my worry, and I think the worry about a lot of people, is what can we do to restore that? Can actually physical planning promote more racial interaction, for instance? Uh, how do we do that? Uh, other than by giving people places to shop together. Can we have people use schoolyards, hospitals, uh, parks, if you like, in ways that make the public realm more political in that sense? That's what's on my mind. Right. So I, I fully agree. We have an enormous quantity of public space when you really think we about do. it. And uh, you know, when Zuccotti Park happened to jump to the political first and the egalitarian second, I think the that those spaces of diversity are much more of a challenge, in my mind, than having a political space. People who want to protest politically can find, I think, a lot of space. We can worry about regulations that exist and whether uh, you know, there's too much management by the authorities. Uh, we push back with you know, rights of free speech and uh, peaceful assembly, by the way, that are guaranteed as individual rights under the United States Constitution. But when I've heard people say, oh, we will design spaces for political protest, I say, you're crazy. I mean, if you design a space for political protest, then the protesters will go to another space. Yeah. So I don't know how many of you have been to Speaker's Corner in Hyde Park. You know, it's just a sort of piece of asphalt, and it's perfectly nice. But, but no, let's, Zuccotti Park was, was perfect for what it was. Indeed, it was right. more perfect than two blocks north, you know, City Hall Park, which you well, that's think, part. You know, that's part of the politics, which is appropriating a space we are not supposed to be. Absolutely. And, uh, and yet, ironically, as many people were aware afterwards, uh, the protesters, the Occupy Wall Street people, had more rights in this <laughs> privately owned public space than they would have had in a publicly owned public space That's called true. City Hall Park. It's true. And you know why? because it turns out that Zuccotti Park had to be open 24 hours a day and City Hall Park closed you know, at night. And all city parks oh, in New York close at night. So whether it was serendipity or a strategic genius, uh, and there are debates on both sides about that, more right. So ownership itself, by the way, does not determine finally what your, your rights are in, in public space. But I think you've hit on a crucial point and one I'm, I remain very concerned about, which is spaces to accommodate diversity, difference, 
not even necessarily conflict, just a lot of different kinds of people. And the way we've, I think, necessarily organized not our spaces, but where people live and work to some degree determines where they interact with other people. So I, I think about one of my obsessively favorite topics of privately owned public space and incentive zoning. Where are all of those plazas and arcades and other outdoor or indoor spaces? Axiomatically, they're at the bases of big commercial and residential buildings that were produced by money. Right. They're not in the low-income neighborhoods. So how do we guarantee equality with privately owned public spaces? Or how do we guarantee equality, of course, the great debate now with the conservancies which around the big parks, the jewels and the crown have money and the neighborhoods don't? Well, you know, my own feeling about this is that we haven't done enough experiments about how to use um, the spaces of public services in New York. When I look at uh, the design of New York City high schools, like Martin Luther King High School, uh, just up here, I look at that and weep, you know? Uh, a space that compared to, say, what people would do in Bogota, Colombia, which is use the inside as well as the outside of the building for lots of different activities. It just makes me ill. For those of us who don't, like me, know exactly what you're speaking well, about. Well, Martin Luther King High School is a fortress. It has very few windows. It has public space, but um, if you get on that public space just to sit, you're likely to be arrested. Um, the same thing is true if somebody goes into Lenox Hill Hospital to talk to somebody else. If you don't check in, because you're, you're, you have a, you're the relative or friend of a patient, you're out. And these monofunctional, uh, the schools, but particularly, you know, they, uh, the library, the same sort of thing. Very hard to hang out in the New York City public libraries unless you can justify why you're there. Um, I think we've got to learn how to use the public facilities we have better to make real meeting grounds between people who differ. And um, that's a planning issue. That's an issue for you legally. It's, I think, a visual issue about how to, how to open those places up so that they're not forts you know, uh, that the inside is guarded from the outside. I mean, there, it's very complex. But I'm very, I'm very optimistic about this. I think New Yorkers are, in the main, they don't want the city to go, in some ways, in this polarized, unequal direction that it's been headed uh, for. It's not just Bloomberg. It's way before that, you know. Global capitalism took this city by the throat. And we largely said, yes, strangle me. <laughs> you know, we, we have to have all this big business. Yes, you know, make it more expensive. Make it more unequal. That's growth. So, you know, I just think we're at a moment where, where people have had enough and we're going to have to, we're going to, have to feel our way through to, to things that are innovative in using what we've had in a more democratic way. Well, it, it raises an interesting question about whether we do have adequate public spaces for people to gather together. What I do mean, you think? I, you know, I, I don't think we do. I, I, I'm beginning to think about uh, and have thought about in the old days when neither of us, and I don't think any of us in this room were around, maybe somebody can help us on this, the idea of the community center. Now, again, one of the problems is our communities tend to be so income segregated that you can't plant something in one neighborhood and assume that it's going to attract a citywide audience. There are very few things that attract citywide. Central Park actually, as an outdoor space, does to some degree serve as certainly a citywide resource. And you know, on its various boundaries, depending on where you go, you can get some degree of diversity, although it still tends to be geographically 
specific, but there is that kind of mixture. But in terms of indoor spaces, I wonder if 50 years ago a community center might have had a more diverse population. Well, uh, and that. Say what you mean. I can't hear you. Okay, well, let him, let, let him try and um, respond to you then. Right, I, I, I don't, I'm not sure. But in, in any event, so having these sort of spaces that can accommodate that, you know, I think we've got the existing outdoor and indoor, uh, as well as the potential for additional spaces, as well as the potential for taking existing and opening them up more. And that's, I think, what we're talking I about. I see. Well, I, I can only tell you, I, I didn't grow up in New York. I grew up in Chicago, and I grew up in a, just to give you an anecdote about this, I grew up in a, a housing project which is uh, pretty much by now destroyed called Cabrini Green. And um, everybody said it was unlivable, but I'm here to tell the tale, is that you, you, could even, uh, you could even prosper from that. But the interesting thing about Cabrini Green was that it was on the edge of a settlement house uh, called Hull House. And there were these masses of poor kids who needed to use this settlement house. Uh, it's uh, where we got tuition after sc extra schooling, uh, where we got most of our health care and so on. But it also served, we were one of the poorest communities in Chicago but it was also on the edge of the Gold Coast, which is, as the name implies, one of the richest. And it was, for kids, it was a meeting ground. You know, kids are uh, a little, they're a little less, um, they're a little more open about shared, shared space. For me, that's always Hull House has always been my model of the kind of institution building I'd like to see happen in cities. That is, shared spaces that are, that are places, buildings, that are functional, that serve more than one uh, population, that don't have an identity as, uh, as belonging to one group of people. Uh, I'll give you another example. On West 13th Street in New York, there is the Lesbian and Gay Community Center. And that's a center that serves a particular community in the village, uh, which is trying to be like Hull House, to serve the needs of people who aren't lesbian, gay, or transgendered, or whatever. And it's the kind of reinvention of the notion of a community center, which isn't about one community. And I think we're going to have to have much, that's a very, it's a very positive uh, development. But we need much more of that. We don't need more, in my view, more parks. We don't need more uh, 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 public space along uh, the river. I mean, if uh, I, I don't like trees very much, so I'm, I'm probably <laughs> the wrong person to ask about this. Well, but you know, you 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 understand what I'm saying. We need we need more public space. So I mean, I I agree. I don't think we have a quantity problem. I don't think it's a quantity problem. Um, I do think there is a quality problem uh, or issue, and that, that arises from what does occur in these spaces. And one can take the benign view of the city will happen, and people should have complete access and make sure that people feel comfortable in every single possible space that we can imagine. We start certainly with our public spaces that formally should allow for everybody to come in as we begin to push to more private spaces or, or purposed spaces, it gets much harder. We're trying to be a library or we're trying to be a, a, right. a private, built. what are you talking, you know. So it, it's more difficult, but we should think as openly as possible to allow 
whatever spontaneously arises to occur. But I actually think we need to be more intentional about encouraging uh, uh, everybody to feel comfortable coming and inviting and wanting people to come. And that means to some degree taking an attitude of, of almost programming to create activities that actually uh, entice people to come in. I, I've thought, wouldn't it be interesting to have somebody, as we keep on talking about uh, uh, fantastic uh, proposals of a, a regional government, well, here's another fantastic one. How about, or there's this deputy mayor for design and planning that's been discussed. Maybe there should be an office of public space. Now, I don't literally mean in the New York City government and office of public space, but having uh, some representation of the public realm or public space, which includes lots of different physical spaces, and recognizing them all together rather than balkanized into the parks or the privately owned public spaces or the libraries or whatever, but recognizing that they add up to something more. The, the, uh, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, requires an intellectualization of that notion of public space. And I'm not sure exactly how that gets manifested finally institutionally, but it would be fun to have a, a steward of public space. I mean, the Municipal Arts Society itself tries to do that as a civic organization. But to have that steward, that curator, that programmer of our public space that encourages everybody to come in might be more than just allowing it to happen spontaneously. Right. Well, let's hope. <laughs> I, I wanted to make one final comment, which is about the relation, it's a little more abstract, about the relation between density and public space. Um, in the past, particularly in uh, uh, Western uh, urbanism, the idea is that you're likely to find these mixed spaces where the population is densest. And so um, you try and put your public resources uh, in the kind of centralized places within a community or a whole city. But that join between density and publicness is something we, um, in the West, we've taken for granted for about 100, 150 years since the time of Haussmann, really, in Paris. Um, one thing I've learned in traveling in the third world is that those two things don't need to go together. That you can sometimes make a better quality public space uh, with less density, uh, that is more locally, that you don't have to concentrate people in a place in order to mix them together. I just came back from uh, Colombia, and it's really impressive how in their poor areas, which are low density, there's a lot of mixture. So, you know, I think we're, we can learn from them, but I think that this whole issue about how public space, where it is, how many people are in it, um, has got to be rethought. And um, we've got to, hopefully, uh, this, he'll get elected. We have a great new mayor coming in. This is, a, uh, the people don't want things to go on as they've been going on. This is a time to really have a thought, a, a think about what it is that we want to do to make New York a more public city. So, um, you know, I, th I, I think we're at a good moment in, in New York. We've come to the end of something, and now we have to do something different. Terrific, I'm so. happy. <laughs> so, thank you thank very you. much. Thank you.